Hello and welcome to Turning Point Church. I'm Fiona and I'm delighted that you've been able to join with us today. We're in this series when we're thinking about the life of Moses, particularly how we can encounter God. And today I'd like us to consider how we can be people who encounter God even in tough times. Last week, Judith said about encountering God, about how to encounter someone is to meet with them, to engage with them, to experience something about them, their wisdom, their love, their humour and their compassion. In our lives we all experience tough times. The interesting thing about the past few years is that we've been experiencing the same tough times but maybe in slightly different ways. Now, Moses and the Hebrew people had experienced tough times. They'd witnessed also, though, the miracles of God. They'd come out of slavery in Egypt, and surely now everything ahead of them would be gorgeous. God had rescued them. Good times ahead. Well, not so much. We're going to catch up with them when they are hungry to the point of starvation. They're thirsty to the point of death, and they've experienced disappointment to the point of bitterness. But what um, we see in the account of the Exodus is two reactions, really two different ways of responding to the same circumstances. The people react one way and Moses um, sort of reacts a different way. Now they are all experiencing the same God and they're witnessing the same miracles. But what we notice is Moses pressing on into new encounters with God, whereas many of the people uh, seem stuck in this cycle of negativity. Now, I'm not sure that we all want to be exactly like Moses and um, have to go through exactly what he went through, but I'm sure that we would love to share some of his characteristics, his faithfulness, his loyalty, his experience of God, and the, the way he seemed to encounter God in such tangible ways. Moses seems to make the most of every experience, each opportunity to encounter God in a deeper and more profound way. But I think if we're honest, if I'm honest, I know that I have the capacity to react the way the Israelites did by groaning and moaning and complaining. Tough times aren't much fun to talk about and I've really wrestled in preparing this message and they certainly aren't great to experience. But they are the times when if we turn to God, we can learn things about ourselves and more importantly about him that we wouldn't get the opportunity to learn otherwise. God can use tough times that you and I will go through to build our faith. So let's look at the people of Israel again and see how they encountered God in tough times and what we can learn from these encounters. And I think the first lesson is that God is our healer. They'd come through the Red Sea in this miraculous way, but once they'd been in the desert for three days, they'd run out of water. And when they did find water, it was bitter and undrinkable. Not fair. So they called that place Mara. And Mara for us is unwanted circumstances where the reaction is for a bitterness in our hearts to develop towards God. And just as an aside, before we go any further, I don't believe that God sends tough times. We live in a fallen world which tough times are part of. Tough times are normal and they happen to all of us. But the response of the Israelites to tough times repeated itself over and over, moaning, groaning and complaining. They had a serious case of the poms, the poor old me's. One writer has said that the problem with grumbling is that it magnifies the past and vilifies the present. Oh, if only we could be back in Egypt, where we were slaves, where we had onions and garlic and pots of meat. Oh, if only poor old me. I'm going to die in this awful place of freedom. Now, grumbling and moaning isn't the preserve of the ancient Hebrews. We can leave Church, all bouncy on a Sunday, God is good, praise the Lord, but on Monday morning, I can't find my car 
keys or my phone's flat and heaven forbid it's raining and I start bumping my gums. I was thinking about this the other day. The weather was so gorgeous like it is today. So I took Ellie down the road to get a meter reading. Long story, but our electricity meter is a quarter of a mile from our house. And the weather was glorious. I'd been ill, but it was so good to get out and feel the warmth of the sun on my face. But you know, we get a spell of three or four days of good weather and then you'll hear someone moaning that it's too hot or it's too dry or the garden needs some water or they don't know what to wear. And then it might turn cold. There's plenty of time for us to have snow. More complaining. But we live in a temperate climate. Translation for non-geography students. Temperate means temperamental. <laughs> the weather can't make up its mind. But it means that we have seasons and things change colour and we have variety. So we don't know what to wear. Just wear layers. Wear layers, people. <laughs> I had a friend whose granny had died and in her grief my friend got stuck in a place of bitter bitterness towards God. She blamed God for her granny's natural death. Her sp perspective was distorted with bitterness and I guess that's the difference. Complaining isn't great but complaining against God develops a bitterness that can corrupt our souls. When we magnify the past and vilify the present, we deceive ourselves. When we face Mara, an unexpected, unwanted, tough time, a place of bitterness, it's also a place of danger for the long-term condition of our hearts. So for all of us, let's try not to stay at Mara. And I'm not trying to minimise the hard times that I know some of you are going through or have been through, or can I say that some of us are going to go through, but let's make sure that we don't stay in that place of Mara, in that bitterness. Let's look at what Moses did in those same circumstances. Then Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became fit to drink. And then a few lines later, we read God saying, I am the Lord who heals you. You know, Moses didn't have his own private water supply. He didn't have his own picnic basket. He would have been thirsty and hungry too. But he cried out to the Lord. He cried out, which is exactly why God had rescued the Hebrew slaves, because they had cried out to him from that place of suffering in Egypt. And then we read, they came to Elam where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped near the water. They found a place beyond bitterness, a good place to stay. For all of us, there is an Elim beyond Mara. Elim means large trees, but it was a well-watered valley, a good place of life and refreshing. There is an Elim beyond Mara if you allow the Lord to heal you. And you can move from bitterness to refreshment and shelter. And this is all a foreshadowing of the work of Jesus in so many ways. When we look to the cross, to our Saviour, to Jesus' work of salvation, we can move from bitterness and hurt to health and refreshing. We don't want to stay in that place of pain or bitterness, but let God show what Jesus has done in releasing all of us, if we choose to accept his gift, releasing us to a place of healing and refreshing and restoration. So God is our healer and God is also our provider. People are understandably worried about what the future is going to look like in material terms. We live in a fairly rural community. Some people are going to have to choose between putting fuel in their cars or turning the heating on or, you know, what food they can buy. It's warm this week, but we know from experience living in a temperate climate that it could be snowing next week. And these basic choices are not just something that people in the ancient desert had to deal with. God had provided 
the Israelites with refreshing water, but it wasn't long before they started going into that cycle of moaning again. And Moses cried out to the Lord. As we said earlier, the problem with grumbling is that it magnifies the past and vilifies the present. If only we died in Egypt, where we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. Pride is the opposite of trusting God. Pride begs us to believe that it all depends on us. Trusting God requires us to place our dependence on him. And the pathway that leads from pride to a place of truly trusting God is paved with humility. When Moses sought God out, God said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. And it's that phrase again, the Lord your God, Yahweh, the one who wants to be everything we need him to be, when we need him to be it, for us. We can do things our way, complaining and moaning, or we can do things your way, by going to God, like Moses did, and trusting him to provide what we need, when we need it. Not what we want, but what we need. The Israelites had been in Egypt for so long that God was having to sever their connection with their past and show them that he would provide for their future. Years before the Exodus, we read Abraham named the place Yahweh Yaira, which means God will provide. Yahweh Yaira or Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And we see in the Exodus account what the Lord Jehovah Jireh can do. And we can see that the extent of his provision is amazing. As Judith said last week, there were over one and a half million people. No supplies for miles around. And God says, I'm going to feed and I'm going to feed you well. In the evening, God somehow organised for about three million quail, these little birds, to fly into the camp. Now, Apologies to vegans and vegetarians. But for 40 years, 52 weeks of the year, every week, God provided quail in the evening and manna in the morning. Five days of the week, there was just enough for that day. And on the sixth day, there was enough for two days, because the seventh day was a blessed and holy day, a day to rest and enjoy God. If they collected too much, if they took matters into their own hands, the food would go off. It would stink and be full of maggots. We can do things our way or Yahweh. God was literally giving them their daily bread as a way of showing them that they could trust him. God provided in a faithful, practical, daily way. But the key is life is better when we do things God's way, not our way. This was supernatural provision so that they could learn to trust God. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses looks back and remembers the way that Jehovah Jireh provided for his people. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes to, from the mouth of the Lord. Every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. When Jesus was 40 days in the desert, those are the words he spoke against Satan. God is our provider. The children of Israel were used to looking down at the ground in Egypt and working hard, working the land to provide for themselves. They trusted in their own ability to provide for themselves. But now they needed to look up and trust God for his provision. And God's provision is what we need. We often think of our needs in terms of basic necessities like food, clothing and shelter, things for our physical needs. But I believe God created us to need more than just physical essentials. Our needs are varied. We also need wisdom and strength and health and friends and loved ones around us. We need gifts and talents and abilities to help us do what we're supposed to do in this life. We need many things and God is willing to meet all our needs as we obey and trust him.
the manna that God provided was not like the food that the Israelites were used to, but God knew that it was perfect nourish, nourishment in the desert. He knows our needs better than we do, and God's provision will protect our hearts. Our desires have the potential to corrupt our hearts. Man-made success and riches and popularity are not what gives us the fullness of life that God desires for us. Only the word of God, the very word of God, can seep into those hungry places of our soul and make the dead and discouraged places within us come fully alive and be deeply satisfied. We must want God most of all. And then he will see that our hearts are prepared and trustworthy to handle other things. When we're hurting, God is our healer. When we experience lack, he's our provider. And when life feels like a battle, he is our victory. After the Israelites moved on from Elam, they were attacked by a people called the Amakalites. And this is Moses reflecting on that sometime later. Never forget what the Amakalites did to you as you came from Egypt. They attacked you when you were exhausted and weary, and they struck down those who were straggling behind. They had no fear of God. Now, this is totally an illustration of being kicked when you're down. Sometimes life just feels like one battle after another. But what do we do? How do we respond in these tough times? Well, firstly, we just need to keep remembering that tough times are normal. Being a Jesus follower doesn't guarantee that things will be super easy. And secondly, we need to do what Moses did, rising above the circumstances and looking to God. Moses was able to have confidence in God because he could look back at how God had rescued them and cared for them. He could stand firm, not letting fears or bitterness take control of him, and he was able to step forward trusting God and honouring God, praising God whilst playing his part and encouraging those around him to play their part too. After he'd prayed to God, Joshua was sent by Moses to get some men and go fight the Amalekites. And then Moses went up a hill with Aaron and Hur and held out the staff of God. Now the staff of God was the one that God had given him way back at the burning bush. He'd had it when they all those amazing um, miracles had been performed in, in, in Egypt and when they'd gone through the Red Sea. And Moses stands there with the staff of God. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amakalites were winning. There are times in our battles, in our tough times, where you and I play a part in the victory. But the key is not to do it on our own. Moses had Aaron, his brother, and Hur with him, and they helped keep his hands up when he grew tired. And Joshua had the people helping him to do the fighting. And sometimes we lose battles because we try and fight them on our own. But that's not maybe the most important thing for us to notice. Moses was up on the hill, but what was he thinking? What was he praying as the battle raged below him? Well, we have a clue, because afterward, Moses built an altar there and named it Yahweh Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. Now, please don't think of um, fluffy flag waving. The Lord is my banner means the Lord is my victory. Moses was saying, get your eyes on the undefeated Lord. This is a banner which is an emblem of victory. Banners that milit the military carry are to remind them that they have won, won a bunch of battles already. They are fighting under the authority of the king, and they just need to remember that. For us, when we fight our battles, our tough times, we are under the authority of Jesus Christ, who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He has defeated sin and illness and death. So in tough times, we need to fix our eyes and our attention on God, the undefeated God, who is our victory. And we're in a better place than Moses because Jesus has never lost a battle. Jesus has won, he is winning, and he will win. We know the end, we know who wins the final battle, and it's Jesus. And that's the key, to get our eyes off ourselves, off our troubles, and on to Jesus. Jesus wants to be everything that we need 
him to be for us. The Exodus account points towards Jesus. It's a foreshadowing of his ministry and of his salvation. And Jesus is sufficient in all our circumstances. The good, the bad and the ugly. God is our healer, our provider and our victory. So as we go through life, we will gain experience, what they call lived experience, not just theory or head knowledge, but actual experience that God is good, that he is our healer, our provider and our victory, if we will only keep turning to him and crying out to him.